by Ice and Caritage the new. This is GYN procedures, dilation, and curatage. The general idea here is to dilate the cervix and then scrape out the endometrial lining. And there's some indications for dilation as a therapy by itself, and those are dysmenorrhea and cervical stenosis. But dilation is uh, by far most commonly done prior to doing something else. So you do dilation and uh, curatage, dilation hysterography, dilation hysteroscopy. Endometrial curatage, um, there's two two main indications for this. So one is as a therapy and the other is um, as a diagnostic procedure. So as a therapy, you can use this to remove tissue. So that would be like retained product of con conception or a molar pregnancy. You can also use it to, as a treatment for bleeding. So let's say somebody has prolonged um, heavy bleeding and they're not uh, doing very well hemodynamically. Endometrial curatage is a good therapy for that. Additionally, related to retained products of conception, if someone's bleeding and that's um, the reason for it, then curatage is what you'd want to what you'd want to do to correct that. As a diagnostic procedure, endometrial curatage is usually used as an either an add-on to hysteroscopy. So you're doing hysteroscopy for some indication, and you want to get um, a sample of endometrium, so you can you can do it for that. And also, if there's a problem with uh, endometrial biopsy done in the office, so for example, let's say there wasn't an, an adequate tissue sample or the diagnosis from the biopsy was equivocal, then you could uh, move forward and and do uh, the curatage. So the contraindications, the absolute one would be if there's a desired intrauterine pregnancy, and the relative ones are infections, so like PID or endometritis, uh, salpingitis, you'd want to um, try to delay the procedure until those infections were resolved, and then also if somebody had a bleeding diathesis, you'd want to think, think about it a little bit more. So the anatomy review, there's not a whole lot of um, anatomy that we're not familiar with here, so um, vagina, then these are the fornix of the vagina here, the most um, deep part next to the cervix. Then we have the external laws, internal laws. If someone's talking about um, endocervical curatage, they're just meaning um, between the internal and the external laws here. Then the body of the, the cavity of the body of the uterus is where you do the endometrial curatage. And above here where the fallopian tubes insert is the fundus of the uterus. So those fornices that we were talking about before, there's the anterior fornix up here by the vesicouterine pouch and then the posterior fornix down here by the rectouterine pouch. The main ligaments that support the cervix, um, the first one is the cardinal coming in from the side here providing some lateral support and so what vessel goes in that is the uterine artery so you have the abdominal aorta branching here and branches off into the internal and external iliacs, the internal iliac divides into an anterior and posterior division. And the uterine artery traveling in the cardinal ligaments a branch of the anterior division of the internal iliac artery, and it also has branches to the cervix um, and the vagina. So in the, the cervical branches tend to travel here at the 3 o'clock and the 9 o'clock position. So these are some positions that are some places that on the cervix that you'd want to avoid uh, when you're manipulating it. The innervation, it's important to note that the cervix has parasympathetic innervation and sympathetic, so the parasympathetics are S2, come from S2 through S4, sympathetics from the um, sympathetic trunk, and they come to the cervix after going through a hypogastric plexus. Knowing this is uh, kind of important because when you manipulate the cervix, you can get a vasovagal response, so simultaneous increase in parasympathetic tone and decrease in sympathetic tone, and the, the drop in blood pressure that comes along with that. So the setup and, and pre-op, you don't need any antibiotics or special testing. Anesthesia can be from uh, ge a general anesthesia to a paracervical block, depending on the indication for, for doing the procedure. Paracervical block means you're, you're injecting into the cervix uh, something like lidocaine or a similar agent that blocks sodium channels and prevents the neurons from depo depolarizing. Patients are in dorsal, dorsal lithotomy position like they are for most of these types of procedures and along with that comes the ner nerve injury so you could have compression of the knee if it's positioned poorly causing um, the perineal nerve injury and foot drop or the hip it could be too abducted or or too uh, flexed so like this and that's the foot uh, and that could cause injury to the femoral nerve specifically the femoral cutaneous causing some anesthesia to the anterior thigh you don't need to fold it you can use a straight catheter to have the patient avoid before the procedure and so you want to visualize this, the, the cervix so you can see it. You can use um, speculum or a retractor anterior and a weighted uh, speculum posteriorly. So then you grab the anterior lip of the cervix with the tenaculum. Um, be careful not to lacerate the lip. 
and you continue. So the step-by-step, -step, start out with a bimanual. Here's the um, vaginal opening, cervix, uterus here. So the angle between the uterus and the, uh, the vaginal opening is the uh, the version. So you want to when you're doing the bimanual, you want to port the version. You're pushing up on the cervix and you're feeling in the abdomen. If you can feel it um, bumping against your hand, then it's probably a little bit antiverted, which is the normal position for, for a uterus. If you can't feel anything, it might be retroverted, so that would be like this, so you're pushing up on it, but you're not able to feel it. And then I'll, you could also report the flexion if you think you can tell uh, which way the which way the uterus is bending with respect to the cervix. So here's the cervix down here. We're going up with our antiverted uterus and then coming this way. So this would be antiverted and antiflexed. Same with post, same with the retroverted uterus. So you're going retroverted and then you curve down this way. So you're retroverted and retroflexed. So the perfor perforation risk factors. Um, so they have to do with a, th a thinned, uh, thinned out myometrium or, or the thinned out uterus, also a, a weak uterus or a cervical stenosis. So a, th a thinned out uterus could be because it's re it's really distended. For example, if someone's pregnant. Or also, if someone's postmenopausal, it could be a little bit weak, and then cervical stenosis is a risk, risk factor because it means you have to p use a lot of pressure to gain access to the uterus. So to, to, after you've done the bimanual, and you want to, sometimes you want to gain further information about the depth of the uterus and its, and its positioning. So you can do that by using a uterine sound. That's just a little uh, metal device that goes into the uterus like so, and it allows you to measure. Um, how how deep it how deep it goes. You don't want to do this in a pregnant person um, or a pregnant uterus. Someone who's been recently pregnant because this that's a uh, contraindication to using the uterine sound just because the perforation risk is too great. And the, the so the Hager and the Hanks dilators. These are what you what you use to do the, the actual dilation. So you remember which one's which by thinking about Hanks shanks. So Hanks are like this. And they usually have two little circles, and they have sort of a more um, pronounced curve at the end as opposed to the Hager ones, which are sort of a gentle curve like that. How much do you dilate? So when you're dilating, you put in um, one side of the dilator, starting out with the small, the smaller side, and then take that out, remove it, put in the other side, which is usually a little bigger, and then grab a new tool and keep working your way up till you get to the size that you need. And so if you're doing a diagnostic procedure or you're using a hysteroscope for some other reason, you dilate to the size of the scope. And then you want it to have an, a fairly um, snug fit so that when you're using the, so when the dis distension medium um, goes in to inflate the uterus so you can, so you can visualize it, uh, it doesn't all just leak out. And then if you're doing a therapeutic procedure, you want to dilate to the size in millimeters corresponding to weeks of gestational age. So if you're seven weeks gestational age, then you want to dilate to seven millimeters. If there's severe stenosis or, or a high gestational age, you want to consider uh, other ways to dilate, not just using the mechanical dilation, using the Hager or Hanks. And so two things that you could try. The first one is uh, a laminaria. These are made of kelp. And they're just a little stick like this, and they have a string attached to them. You put that in the cervix, it absorbs water and, and, and expands, so it slowly dilates the cervix over a number of hours. And you could also use mesoprostol, so that's a prostaglandin. You've probably seen uh, this used as a cervical ripening agent, so you give mesoprostol usually um, vaginally and then oxytocin IV to help induce labor. It can also be used as an abortifactant, so when it's done as an abortifactant, it can be combined with uh, mifepristone. And remembering the these two and the mechanism of action is a little tricky because they both start with M and the mechanisms both start with P, so mifeprostol is a prostaglandin, mifepristone is a progesterone receptor antagonist. Okay, Mifepristone is a recept progesterone receptor antagonist. And endocervical curatage is the idea behind this, and it's um, so it's only done sometimes. But the idea behind it is that you get one sample from the endocervix and one sample from the the endometrium. And so you want to do the curatage of the endocervix before the before you dilate or or do the curatage of the endometrium, so that you only have cells from the endocervix in that sample. For example, if you do the dilation before you put the dilator in, it goes past the internal laws a little bit into the endometrium, and then you could have cells from the, the endometrium mixing with the endocervix, which would kind of defeat the purpose, because you want two different samples so that you can see, for example, if cancer is 
um, spread to the spread to the cervix, or if, or if there's some other pathology that's isolated to the cervix or present in both the cervix and the and the endometrium, the, the body of the uterus. So let's say you did a endocervical curatage and then did a Pap smear a couple of weeks later. The Pap smear would would might come back as being suspicion suspicious for dysplasia because when you disrupt um, these cells and do all and do the scraping off. When they grow back, it looks similar to dysplastic cells, and this is just showing what a the device looks like for doing the curatage. So, this is what's important down here. There's a little hole um, for the tissue to pass through, and then there's the sharp, um, the sharp circle surrounding the hole. So now let's say you've you've done that. If if you're going to, it's not it's not done very frequently because it's that 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 being the endocervical um, curatage isn't done all that frequently because it's not. Uh, that sensitive or specific. But let's say you've done that or not, and now you're ready to move on to the endometrial curatage. You, if you're going to be looking for evaluating the endometrial lining and looking for polyps, then you want to do the hyster, use the hysteroscope first. And that's because if you find polyps, you want to take them out relatively intact before grinding them up with the curette, so the pathologist can look at them and have a better chance of deciding if they're benign or um, malignant with their architecture preserved. So there's two main types of curatage. There's sharp which is like the picture we just we just saw. And so that's that's uh, to remove the endometrial lining so you scrape all around the uterus trying to get trying to get the the entire endometrial lining off and you do this uh, scraping until you hear the uterine cry and that's really something you feel it's the sort of gritty sensation that you feel after you've scraped off the uh, endometrium uh, a sufficient amount. And the other way to do uh, curatage is by using suction. So this this is mainly used for uh, removing larger amounts of tissue, for example, like removing products of conception, and it's we can go over the terminology for um, different types of abortion. So we'll just do it quiz style. So what's a threatened abortion? It's vaginal bleeding less than 20 weeks. How about an inevitable abortion? That sort of builds on threatened abortion. So that's bleeding, but also includes cramps in the cervix, starting to dilate. And what's the difference between incomplete and complete abortion? That's pretty much what the name says. So complete all the products of conception have been delivered or incomplete. Some of them uh, remain inside the uterus. And completes tend to happen uh, less than 12 weeks and incompletes greater than 12 weeks. How about missed abortion? So that's the in utero uh, death of fetus less than 20 weeks and with retention of the pregnancy so the cervix stays closed. So back to the, back to the suction. So you're using a, p a plastic tube or a cannula hooked up to a device that provides some negative pressure to remove the tissue and then after you've you finished with the suction um, curatage you can go back and and use them the metal um, curette that we saw that we saw earlier to get the endometrial lining and any remaining um, tissue that you want and when you do this you you want to use oxytocin to prevent bleeding so as by way of review oxytocin comes from the paraventricular nuclei supraoptic nuclei and the hypothalamus gets released by posterior pituitary and then works on its own oxytocin receptors and it does milk down, milk letdown and, and contraction. Contraction of the uterus is what's important for um, preventing the bleeding. So the complications um, in, in post-op, you can kind of think think about this as by just going along what you do in the procedure. So the first thing you do is um, sort of access the cervix and dilate it. So the problems that can come up there would be laceration, so you want to avoid uh, three and nine, and also you could have a vasovagal response. And then, so you're you're dilating and you're using the uterine sound. So uh, also with curating itself, you can have perforation. So with perforation, it's pretty rare, about less than one percent. Yeah, you'd suspect perforation is if the instrument they're using uh, goes into the uterus further than you think the uterus than than you measured the uterus to be. So if you think it's eight centimeters and you went in nine centimeters or ten centimeters then you might be concerned that you perforated and how would you know you'd be sure that you had perforated the uterus if one if you saw a hole in the wall for example if you're using the hysteroscope and you see a hole you'd also know it if you sent the endometrial um, sample and the pathologist said that there's adipose tissue in it and then thirdly you would know if you saw in the suction device that you were using or, or otherwise inside the uterine cavity um, adipose tissue and the reason why adipose tissue is important is because if you make that hole in the uterus, especially if you're using suction, then you can suck in um, the fat, omentum, um, and bowel from from the abdominal cavity into the into the uterus itself. And so, what you're worried about with with perforation is damage to the bowel or damage to blood vessels. For example, if you perforate the lateral wall of the uterus, you might be concerned about damage to um, pretty major vessels like the uterine artery. 
to how you manage it if you're if you're suspicious and you're not seeing any um, like clinical signs or, or any symptoms of of perforation then you'd want to keep the person for a day and just and monitor them and if you're if you're more concerned or if someone's de if someone looks like they might have um, some hemorrhage or you think that you damaged some bowel then you'd want to do a laparoscopic procedure to evaluate that further so you gain access to the abdomen and then you could um, fix any vessels that were damaged or see if or see if the bowel if the bowels were actually injured and so the risk with suction curatage is um, here just just what I talked about how you're, you're using that negative pressure so if you do make a hole you can suck um, you can suck bowel into the hole you can also have bleeding for example if you're um, removing a polyp or something that starts to bleed that can be a side effect and you can use a uh, tamponade with a Foley catheter that's one kind of cool treatment you could try for that and then there's Asherman's um, syndrome so when you're doing the or Asherman's disease when you're doing the scraping doing the curetting if you there's the the functional layer which is the layer that sheds off and then there's the the salus layer which is the layer that um, regenerates that has the stem cells in the endometrial lining so if you're doing your scraping and you start to really scrape the, the salus layer you can have uh, scarring and lots of adhesions that that form as a result of that and the the main instance when this happen when this happens is a a pregnant uterus or someone who is recently pregnant so for post operative things there's the perforation management um, which we talked about and then there's no real real special um things that you have to do the person can go home on the same day and start resuming activities as as they tolerate them so the questions so things that you might get asked, so let's say the cervix is bleeding when you're um, grabbing the tenaculum or something, and they might ask, where's that blood coming from? So you could say, you could tell them the anterior division of the, the internal iliac, and that's easy to remember because this is the cervix, which is uh, part of the uterus and it has the same blood supply. If someone's uh, blood pressure suddenly drops, you're manipulating the cervix, what's going on there? That's a va vasovagal response. And then so the, the indications for doing this, you could go over those. And so what are the what are the ways to divide it up? Well, there's the therapeutic reasons and the diagnostic reasons. So therapeutic reasons is for removing tissue, so for products of conception or molar pregnancy. Then there's the diagnostic reasons. So that would be if there was maybe an inconclusive biopsy done in the office or you otherwise need to get a, a sample of endometrial lining. And then complications, just go through what you do in the procedure. So if the problems that could happen with the cervix, problems that could happen um, when you're dilating um, or using the uterine sound like perforation, and then problems that could happen when you're using the curette like Asherman's. And then there could be specific questions based on the indication for that person. So why are they having it done? Maybe they're the disease that they have. And the questions you could ask, you could ask about the vas vasovagal response. I never actually saw that happen to anyone, but you could see if it's if it's fairly common or or or, or what they what they think about that. If they do if they have any tips to try to avoid it happening. You could see if misoprostol is used as a way to as a way to dilate uterus very frequently, I mean the cervix very frequently, and then finally you could you could see if they think that um, endocervical curatage is, is useful for evaluating things like cancer given its um, not very good sensitivity and specificity is it something that's used um, clinically. So that's the overview of um, dilation and curatage.